Greetings, everyone. I'm Scott Rodell here at the Great River Dawa Center, which is home to our Academy of Chinese Swordsmanship. In this episode of Chinese Swords and Swordsmanship, I have a really unique, I believe, one of a kind Chinese Duan Dao. Now, I know if you look at it like this, many people are going to be saying, well, that just looks like uh, many Duan Dao that I've seen, short Chinese sabers that I've seen. And I'd say, yeah, that, that's true if you're looking at this side. However, when you flip it around, you see that it has some very, very unique features and a feature that I think generally makes this one of a kind. I've never seen this on any other Chinese sword and I've, I've handled several thousand. So I'm pretty sure this is unique and that is this utility knife here that is slides in to the, what would be the outside of the scabbard where the way a Chinese and Manchus tended to sling their swords when they wore them on the hip. And that, of course, is a feature adopted into just onto this sword from Japanese swords. And it is called, Japanese would call that little utility knife a kogatana. I think that's a really interesting, amazing feature, and we're going to talk more about that, of course. First thing, though, to think about is how this was slung and how it was seen. Very typically, of course, the Chinese saber is worn with the hilt back. And they probably drew them by taking up the hilt this way. It was hung from lanyards, and as it hangs on your side there, you can flip it up and bring it around for the draw. Uh, this particular example, though, is interesting because coming from a Japanese inspiration, uh, typically that would be on the inside for a Japanese sword. But then again, of course, Japanese swords wore their blades edge up, which puts it on this side for this Chinese version, and of course back it is there where it can be very clearly seen. One real difference though is, and you'll see how this slides out in a moment, is that unlike on a Japanese sword, there is no hole here. So on a Japanese guard and on a suba, you have a little hole there in the guard so that you can slide it out here. You can hear, I, I, if I slide that back and forth, I'm just tapping on the inside of the guard there. You can't draw this small utility knife without drawing the blade. So if I do that, if I, if I draw that, set that aside for a moment, let's take a quick look at, at this sword. So again, you can see there's no holes on either side. So you cannot draw the utility knife without first drawing the blade. So that's something that's, although this is clearly inspired by a Japanese sword, they didn't adopt that one feature. Uh, the blade itself is, is a little bit on a smaller side. It's a, uh, 53 centimeter blades, so it's 21 inches. Uh, the smaller blade here is a, a, has 11 centimeter blade, so that's just four and a half inches. That's 23 and a half centimeters overall, and nine inches altogether. So, you know, in a, a typical size uh, utility knife, very useful out of size. Put that down for a moment. Uh, we look at this Duan Dao. It's it's a very nice one. It has you know it moves, it cuts. It would, I think it would cut pretty well, although it's definitely on the light side at 490 grams. That's a one pound, one ounce. So it's a little bit light. If I were having to defend myself, you know, in a, in a situation where my, my Dwei Fang, the guy coming after me, had a heavier weapon, say any kind of pole arm or any kind of full size sword, this would be a little bit on the light side. If I were to tea house or someplace like that, where somebody just also just had a knife, this would be plenty. If we look at the fittings, there's also a couple of very interesting features that I've only seen a few times in the past on Ming and earlier Qing swords, and that is this sort of concave or hollow ground shape to all the fittings. It even has a little groove that goes around, a little hollow ground area, sort of right around there, almost like a, like a pulley would be. And if we look at that, that hollow ground shape is repeated on all the fittings. So we look at all around, there is a little concave area there. And, and that's not really, really unusual. You might say it's seldom seen. As I said, I've seen that on uh, a Ming piece and on a later Qing piece, which was probably a replica of that earlier Ming piece. So. It's not typical, but it's not extremely rare. You see it now and then. Another feature here that is uh, really standard is the tiliang here, the, the suspension band. That's you know, probably 
almost out of the part box. It's a very standard, you could say, typical design for that suspension band. Uh, but this dragon here is very interesting. The Lung Tran style, swords made in, in, in Lung Tran, China, uh, had this. Many of the earlier ones had some sort of dragon here. This is a really quite interesting, unusual example, uh, very stylized. You might almost say it looks Art Deco if you didn't know it was, was Qing Dynasty. So uh, very impressionistic, if you will. Uh, so that's an interesting interpretation of that. And curious that that got mixed in with these other features. This sort of is really an interesting amalgamation of fairly unusual uh, features, not, not, not the typical, not the standard. For example, that sort of concave, hollow ground way of doing the fittings here, more typically they're rounded the other way. So whoever had this sword made for themselves really was looking for something that would stand out, that would be different from what everybody else had. Another interesting little feature here is you can see there's a little hole there, right there at the head of the dragon, and so probably a tassel was hanging there. So this is quite a flashy piece, I think you could say. And then when you have that hanging on the hip with the utility knife also there on the outside of that, right, and that's all there, and imagine that brass all shined up and new with a very shiny black scabbard, nice lacquer scabbard, it probably really jumped out, really, was a sign of the owner's status. Uh, if we look at the utility, I'm going to call it a utility knife because it's not a Japanese piece, so I'm not going to use the Japanese term, but I'm going to call it a utility knife. It is very interesting. Somebody might argue I should call it by a Japanese name because it is constructed absolutely in the sort of Japanese fashion. You have the steel blade with a brass handle that's slid over that. One interesting different feature, maybe I'm wrong about this, if somebody out there is an expert on Japanese swords and can, can add something, please put that in the comments. But I don't think it's very common to see this sort of button here. There's a, a round piece and it looks like it's fairly polished, like it's been rubbed a lot. Uh, and that may help for indexing if you want to use it. I can feel where that would go. It rests between the index and second finger. So if I had to use this knife, it, it helped to index it, not to, since there's no guard, not to slip up on it. But that could just be an added little feature. Uh, it is decorated with Buddhist symbols and uh, scholarly symbols. So again, I think if somebody was trying to show off a little bit, show their status and show who they were, and it has here a little, that little hollow ground area so that when it slides in, it matches up right with that. So it's really some fine work, really nicely work done. Whenever I take a look at a sword like this, something that's really unique, something that's really different, I really wonder about who would have used this. Clearly this was somebody, at least in my mind, who really likes swords <laughs> because they took the time to, to really make it nice and really thought about what they could do to make their sword stand out and be different from others. And so I think that's telling us something about who probably owned it. Somebody probably of a little more status, probably somebody who's a little more worldly because this had to be somebody who was pretty familiar with Japanese swords. To, to add this feature of the, of the utility knife, that's not the kind of thing your average Chinese person probably would have known in the Qing period. So this could have been somebody who was maybe even traveling Japan, to Japan, maybe in a coastal area that had some sort of trade back and forth with Japan. I wonder was even somebody who might have even collected Japanese swords. I mean, did, did the owner of, of this sword, this really nice Dao, how did he tell the smith what he wanted? Did he draw that out? Or I'm thinking more likely he had one or two examples, maybe several examples of Japanese swords. And now again, we a fairly unusual thing that somebody is getting something from a foreign culture and bringing it into their own culture and adapting it on the sword. Because we have to keep in mind, the Chinese tended to think of themselves as being the middle kingdom. They were the center of everything. People came to them for knowledge and information. So they didn't tend to take a lot of other things from different cultures. So it's very, really quite interesting here that this has been adopted onto this uh, Duan Dao. And it makes you, again, wonder what, what was this man like who had this? Uh, of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that, especially for a Manchu bannerman who wants to show off his status, a sword is kind of jewelry for men, 
other than his thumb ring, which would show his status as a, as a bannerman, a member of the warrior class, how else is he going to show off who he is? And I think uh, this sword really does that. Um, when and where might have this sword been used? How would it have been carried? Well, for one thing, it, like I said, it's a little bit light. It's a little bit on the light side. It doesn't quite have the oomph, the power. If, if somebody's really coming at me with a full weight weapon, you know, a, a proper two pound uh, Tao, or even one a little bit lighter than that, maybe a shorter one, this is kind of on the light side for deflection, right? It, it, I could do it. I'd probably spend a lot of time slipping and evading because this just doesn't have a lot of mass. On the other hand, somebody of this kind of status, his weapon is going to be his guards. He has bodyguards around him. So I don't think he had to be too worried about really using it. It's, this is a really backup, backup weapon. So around town, that would be one, one reason to have a sword like this. All polished up. Imagine that brass really bright and shiny, really you know, shined up, lacquer scabbard. That's something that's going to really show your status as you walk around town. And of course, you have your bodyguards that are also showing your status. Another place I think this is really likely to have been worn was on the hunt. One way they practiced their archery for warfare was by hunting. They'd go out as a group. They had to work together as a group, surround and chase an animal, and of course, eventually kill it. And when they did, they still wore their sabers on their side. But often, if we look at uh, period paintings of hunting, what do we see? They're generally not always carrying the real long saber. So if you're out in the hunt with your friends, you probably don't want a full-size saber banging around on your hip all day. So I think another t place that a sword like this really would have been worn to again show one's status would have been on the hunt, right? Whether you're with your friends or actually on, say, an imperial hunt with somebody from the royal family. When I look at this Duan Dao, this short sword, this kind of a small package, if you will, it really intrigues me. It really brings up a lot of interesting questions, questions which, frankly, I can't answer, which makes it even more than interesting to me. Uh, how in the world did somebody, who I'm assuming is a Manchu bannerman, learn about this style? Did he go to Japan? Did, he, did Japanese come to China on a trade mission? Maybe he was somebody involved in trade with Japan. Maybe just somebody lived on the coast and happened to see it. Did he collect Japanese swords? All these questions we will never know the answer to, but it's very interesting to mull them over. And I'm quite interested in hearing from people out there who might have their own theories or some more information about how this feature, how this utility sword, this ko katana, ended up on a Manchu bannerman's duanda. Please comment below. I'm anxious to hear what everybody thinks. Until next time, thanks everybody and zaijian.